Welcome. Hello, everyone, far and near. Welcome to Call Camp. Glad you're here. This is Steve Richard. Um, I'm going to kick it off today. I'm going to hand the reins over to some people who are far more competent than I am, I can tell you that, uh, with Lori Page and Kyle Smith at the Bridge Group. Let me give you a little bit about them first so you understand who, you, who you're dealing with. Um, if you look up Inside Sales Consulting, you're going to find no fewer than 80% of all Google search results will be filled with uh, the Bridge Group's content. They are known as being the name in inside sales consulting. There's none. There's none better. There's really no, none that come close. Other people do different things that are adjacent, but they are the. They are known as the top brass. So uh, Lori Page and, and Kyle Smith, principals with the Bridge Group. Um, I've known a lot of their clients over the years, and I've never heard anything negative. It's all been positive, positive, positive. So you have an unbelievable uh, couple of guest coaches here today. And they're just going to take this thing and run with it. Building value. You know, you think about the time of the year that we're in right now. Boy, you better be building value right now because you got to close out your business in the remainder of the year. And I can tell you per personally, we closed a lot of stuff in the end of, uh, of uh, September, in the, in the middle of October, that all came from value that we built in the spring, you know, you know, a long time ago. So building value throughout that whole process is so, so important. So with that, let me kick it off and, and hand it over to... Uh, Kyle Smith and Lori Page with the Bridge Group. Lori, take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Steve. As Steve said, uh, my name is Kyle Smith. And just in addition to what Steve had mentioned about us being anti sales consultants and working with a lot of different companies uh, over the years, Lori and I are both also practitioners. And I think that's an important distinction. We're still individuals who get on the phone. Uh, execute sales calls on a daily basis in addition to what we do working with our client sales teams doing training coaching and reinforcement so we still pick up the phone still make cold calls so approach uh, this call camp not only as uh, industry experts or from a management perspective but also as reps ourselves and kyle but i think Steve i just want to I just want to add to that though kyle we also record all of our calls and critique them as well so we're very we're very used to this process <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and as Steve said, and as you saw on the slide, the, na the main theme for the webinar today is going to be about building value through every single stage and every call that's part of the sales process. And so the bullets that you see on the screen now are more focused on the sales development piece of that process. So that initial call, the, the first point of contact, whether it's following up on an inbound lead that's been sourced through marketing or making a strategic outbound call. We want to make sure that to effectively build value in those conversations, that we are trying to solve a challenge that the prospect or the prospective buyer has as part of their day-to-day -day life. Uh, so making sure that we're doing that, not just trying to book a meeting, right? So we all understand that the ultimate goal of the sales development or business development function is to book meetings. That's where the comp plan is tied. And that's how management measures uh, reps and those individuals. Um, but we want to make sure that we're solving the buyer challenges to get to the point where we're getting on the phone and, and booking a meeting, not just going in, trying to sling meetings and putting a bunch of garbage on the calendars of the account executives who we support as sales development professionals. And you'll hear today on, on the call that we're going to listen to or the calls that we'll listen to uh, usage of customer stories. And I think there's an important distinction between sharing a story and using that story of success that you've had with your customer base versus just using name drops. Um, so at the Bridge Group, we receive uh, solicitation all the time. Are people trying to sell to us? We are a small 20-ish person consulting company. We're professional services. And if someone calls in and they say, yeah, we work with Walmart, GE, and Apple, Right, that those aren't really names that matter to me as a as a principal for a 20 person consulting company. So a name drop versus a story that relates directly to that individual um, have two very different uses. And the story about overcoming a challenges or how you helped that uh, customer build more value uh, is completely different and helps build your case to get towards that meeting. And I think just in general, if you aren't adding value, if you aren't talking about solving the buyer challenges, if you're not, uh, if you're just pitching product or services, talking about features or functionality, then you're going to get a unengaged prospect on the other end of the line, who's just going to be doing everything they can to rush you off and move on to whatever else they have in their day. So the only way to get true engagement, get a meaningful dialogue back and forth, 
is to add value through addressing challenges and sharing relevant customer stories. Okay, great. Thanks, Kyle. And taking a slightly different twist, as Kyle mentioned, the first slide was a bit more focused on front end of the process, sales development activities, whether you're an AE or a sales development rep, doesn't really matter, but kind of those initial early conversations. So we wanted to be sure to talk about the benefit of value, of adding value throughout the process from a sales or from an AE perspective. So we've all participated in those discovery calls, which in some cases sound more like an interrogation. Um, I think to Kyle's point on engagement, it's all about engaging with our buyers. Sure, at the end of the day, we have qualification information that we're trying to obtain during this discovery call. However, and you know, I think if Steve were still on the line, we go back to the days where BANT, as an example, was a qualification criteria that we were trying to obtain throughout the discovery call process where we would interrogate the prospect and say with very specific direct questions like, do you have budget or do you have authority to make this purchase, et cetera. But today's selling environment is all about conversation. It's all about adding value and relevancy and it's all about not necessarily interrogating, and again, as Kyle mentioned on the prior slide, infusing customer stories is a nice way to show value and better engage with prospects, where at the end of the day, we're still gonna obtain some of that qualification information and discovery information that we're seeking on that call. For those of you who do demos at the Bridge Group, as, as we said, uh, we work with a lot of organizations where teams are conducting demos, and I will say that often we feel as if and see a lot of organizations, and so I, I challenge anyone who provides and delivers demos on the call to think about their own demo process and the way that they deliver, is it are, are we talking about the business challenges that we're solving, or are we just showing the technology? And again, depending on what you're selling, may, you may combine a bit of that where you are showing aspects of the technology, but very often we'll go in and, and observe reps conducting live demos where it literally feels as if it's a training or an implementation call, or maybe it's a customer success call. And again, if you're in the early stages of the sales process, or i.e. they're not an existing customer yet, so it's not meant to be a customer uh, success call where you're literally educating them on your technology and getting them up and running on the platform. If it's not that, show the good stuff first, right? So show the sizzle. And again, often we'll see reps let me bring you into our login page. And we start with kind of the boring, tedious stuff. We don't have to do that on our demos. Um, so the takeaway here, remember that a demo should be talking about the business challenges, lead with the good stuff, show the good stuff, and end with the good stuff as well. And just be cognizant that it's not meant to be a training session. It's not meant to be an exercise where we're gonna show every aspect of our technology you know, from a technology perspective. And lastly, I think for, for all of those sales professionals on the line, I'm sure you've all heard about the value of being that trusted advisor. And that is so important in today's selling environment. So again, keeping in mind that from a discovery call, we're not meant to interrogate, we're here to provide value, uh, share messaging uh, that is relevant to prospects and to our unique buyers, and that may vary on our buyer, but be sure that we're providing value throughout the, the whole process. And I have one quick story. Um, Kyle and I were chatting about this yesterday, and, and we have a customer, as Kyle mentioned, we're practitioners, so we sell on a regular basis as well. And an example of becoming that trusted advisor, we engaged with a, a prospect. They had not necessarily signed a deal, we went so far to invite them to a, a live event. It happened to be HubSpot's inbound event. Invited that prospect to come. We were able to meet that person face to face and continue to add value throughout that process, even before we got 
before we signed um, we signed this particular um, contact, you know, as a customer. So again, just remember, being that trusted advisor, it doesn't stop and start at different stages. It should be continuous, and your activities are going to vary, uh, really, at different at different stages. So providing value outside of calls, sending relevant content, right? We've, we've all heard about that. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are doing it. Maybe marketing put together a great white paper or there's a great third party source. What we always recommend doing though is instead of just sending that white paper, maybe highlight, pull out a section, pull out a paragraph, pull out a phrase and say, Kyle, I thought based on your role at XYZ Company that you would find this particular piece of content relevant to your role, specifically page two where it talks about compensation plans or what have you. Um, so again, adding value throughout, not just being an almost like an automated marketing email where we're just gonna distribute content, but making sure that we're taking the time and it doesn't take too, too much time. We hear this all the time from teams. Well, what is the balance of my pre-call planning and taking time off of the call to identify what I'm gonna send and what I'm gonna share? It can be done pretty quickly um, and you can categorize it based on your buyers. So my white paper example, if you're selling to a director of sales, maybe you're gonna highlight one or two pages. And if you're selling to a C-level executive, you might be highlighting other content in the in the white paper. Yeah, and I think one, in the same vein of what Lori just said of highlighting and doing the work for the prospect, if we are going to use uh, content, whether it's from your marketing team or third party validation content, we have to make it as easy as possible for the prospect to absorb that content. And one of the ways uh, that we can do that is to leverage video. Right. So to sit down, read and consume a 30 page white paper is a significant time investment for someone who already has a ton on their plate. But if you can serve them up a 30 to 90 second video that articulates that same basic content in a more concise way that's easier to consume there, you increase the likelihood that they're actually going to click on watch and listen to uh, the content of that video. So I'm not saving, saying go do you know 20 selfie videos and post them on LinkedIn a day um, and create this brand as an industry expert, but find video content, whether it's third party that's talking about what you're trying to communicate to your prospect or things sourced to you specifically from your own internal marketing department. But the gist is make it easy on the prospect. Don't give them homework. Right. In leveraging social, so I, I work with quite a few security companies as an example, and going back to being that trusted advisor and ensuring that you're that trusted advisor, leverage social, leverage some of the content, um, participate in some of the discussions that are on LinkedIn, uh, in some cases share you know, blog posts or third party uh, validation. Prospects care about this and it just shows that you're a thought leader in the industry. And so that when you do reach out and they do hear Laurie Page from the Bridge Group, it's gonna resonate with them. Or if they go and see the type of content that you've been sharing and some of the types of dialogue and, and um, things that you've been involved in, then again, it just shows, okay, this person understands my industry, understands my business, and is viewed as a thought leader. So I think the leveraging social is an area that a lot of reps think that they do well, but again, and, and reach out to your marketing departments. You know, I was at a client last week and the marketing team provides awesome content that is so uh, actionable and, um, you know, can be shared with anyone, leverage all of that. And in this particular case, it happened to be sales development reps. I think there were 10 reps, only one was leveraging it. So take advantage of, of what your marketing teams have and get creative, have fun with it. <clears throat> awesome points, Lori. This is Sam from ExecVision, everyone. And as always, we want you participating in the conversation. So I would love to hear on Twitter or in the chat box, what unique ways is your team building value? Are you out there on calls actively sharing something that's not related to what your company does? Uh, are you sharing videos on LinkedIn? 
what are you up to? Show us how you're building value and I will jump in with any great answers I get. Perfect. Great. All right, so let's listen to some calls. <laughs> Get to the fun part. All right, Lori and Kyle, I'm going to play it right from here. You guys tell me when to start and stop. Perfect. Okay. Hey, Jason, this is Jackie. We're at 360 Live. How's it going this afternoon? Good, yourself? Doing pretty well, thanks. I know I'm catching you fairly out of the blue here. Do you have a quick second to chat? Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> just, probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll keep it short and sweet then. Um, I was actually doing a little bit of research, and I figured given your role with marketing and communications, um, I'm sure you're wearing many hats. I was actually curious to see... How, or how involved you are with membership, engagement, and retention for events? Let's pause it here. Somewhat. So, so right out of the gates, yep. she started with the pre-call research and sharing with the prospect that this individual was not just a name on a list, right? It wasn't just powering through, calling anyone and everyone, but that she had a specific reason to reach out to this individual because they had a role that mapped to what she was trying to talk about. You can play again. Okay, glad I'm generally in the right place here. Um, yeah, I've actually been having a couple other conversations recently with other professional societies and associations um, just about membership retention and being able to prove ROI for members uh, for going to these events, annual events and industry events. Um, and I know you guys just recently had your digital marketing strategy conference in February, so wanted to see how you guys had been doing that from uh, a marketing perspective. Let's pause it again here. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> again, I think uh, I think to Kyle's point, she leveraged her pre-call planning and her research, um, knew about the event, and asked a great open-ended question. So very conversational, very engaging. She's leveraging the information that she's that she's learned. Love it. Yeah, I think the transition question is the big piece here. So we can do the pre-call research or the three by three that's been branded by Steve to share with the prospect, you know, answer the, or do the show me, you know me, right? So she did the show me, you know me, articulated the pre-call research, both on the person's role, as well as some something relevant and recent that's happened within that company, either through press releases or looking on their social feed, wherever she gathered the information, but then taking that information to ask an open-ended and intelligent question to get the prospect talking, right? We're at the minute 19 second mark with the, you know, with the ringing in the beginning, but now it's time we need to hand the reins back over to the prospect, get them engaged and start hearing their voice and get them involved in the discussion. And Kyle, I think she also mentioned the third party as well and other organizations. So that ties in our trusted advisor as well, which is awesome. Exactly. Yep. We can play again. Being able to engage and retain your members for mm -hmm. that conference. Um, so the, the short answer is most of that falls to the chapter where our events are located, which usually retain the membership um, of people that attend events in their cities. And um, the follow-up is done by them and engaging the locals um, in their ongoing programs. Um, and then from headquarters for, um, you know, additional uh, you know, ongoing communication to them about the other benefits that they're receiving uh, as part of the... Can you pause here quick? Yeah. And so by asking that intelligent open-ended question that was relevant to the individual um, that the rep was reaching out to, she just over a 40-second time block gathered some extremely valuable information that she'll be able to use as ammunition later on in the call to more effectively position what it is she's trying to pitch um, and truly add value that is specific to this company now, not just, uh, you know, high level or uh, articulate a message that could apply to anyone. 
can play again. Big game through the conference. Interesting. So it's a fairly segmented sort of uh, position that you guys have within the mm-hmm. – within, okay. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, we've actually – I don't know if you're familiar with us at all. Uh, we've been working with a couple other associations in the industry. Uh, we worked with the American Hotel and Lodging Association recently, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. helping them really be able to bring their events, um, not just as a 20th century trade show necessarily, but really bringing it into a 21st century uh, experience to be able to help really get – members and potential members engaged and excited about coming to these events. Um, since they do tend mm-hmm. to bring so much revenue and be able to really boost the reputation within the industry, uh, keeping it, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that relevance alive uh, within the industry. So um, that being said... Let's pause it here. Sam, you can, yeah, I was just going to say, love, love, love the customer story. As Kyle mentioned on one of his slides, sharing customer stories that are relevant, it's extremely conversational it ties in, you know, the, the value that her organization brought. And any time that you can engage in, and share customer stories at any point throughout the process is always a positive. Yeah, it wasn't just running down a bulleted, bulleted list of the logos uh, that she has worked with or that the company has in their customer portfolio. It was, again, like we talked about in the slide portion, articulating a actual story of, who did they work with? What specifically did they work with them on? And what was the value seen as a result of that engagement? You can play again. How well, have you guys been able to do that? On the, I know you have such a global uh, presence within the industry. How have you guys been doing that? Is it mainly still within the chapters? Or is, that, is there one person who's really overseeing all of that engagement retention for events? Um, it, it varies by the type of event and the segment that it's in. Um, you know, so we just did, we're doing a series of revenue, um, management related events in cities around the country. And that, that would fall again to the chapters that they're in and also, you know, our revenue management advisory board for subject matter types of uh, engagement going forward and the same we have the same for for digital marketing as well so it's our our events are very um are very topic specific so it becomes you know part of the engagement from the leaders and whatever those particular uh, segments are that that we have uh, for the organization Okay. Okay. That, I, we don't really do. We don't really do general association meetings and events. Mm-hmm. So definitely more of a segmented, topic-specific approach. Yeah. Cause I mm-hmm. kind of thought so based on. Can we pause it here. Market. So this is the this is the third time in the call that uh, the rep has gathered information from the prospect and done a really quick recap to clarify that. Once she is understanding what it is that the, that the prospect is giving her in terms of information about what they're doing today, and then also validate that, yes, I am listening to you. I'm not just on the call to pitch something and push it down your throat, but we are here having a back and forth dialogue. I hear what you're saying. I understand what it is that you're telling me, and I'm going to use that to direct how I take the conversation from here. Yeah, and I think, Kyle, to your point, it starts with the open-ended questions, right, so so that the prospect feels comfortable with opening up and sharing some of that information, and then, you know, the rep's ability to listen and to recap um, is is good. Play it again. Going into that revenue optimization conference in June. Um, Mm -hmm. Okay, Mm -hmm. that makes a lot more sense. Um, Interesting. So, just out of professional curiosity, I know you know one of the issues that has been coming up over and over in these conversations I've been having uh, with other professional societies um, is being able to really engage millennials um, as upcoming leaders within the industry. Is that something that you can stop, ASM? <laughs> I think this was great where she's highlighting one of the business challenges, right? So she's saying and validating that she's hearing this from other organizations. Again, back to that trusted advisor and bringing up a challenge. And I think sometimes when Kyle and I listen to the call together, sometimes this gentleman might not be thinking about, oh, okay, engaging millennials is a challenge for me. But when it's positioned that way, as other organizations are seeing it and it's positioned that way to him, he's like, hmm, yeah, maybe it is, it is a bigger challenge than I had thought about. 
So I think my point here is sometimes it's not super obvious what our challenges are, and I think that the rep did a fabulous job of validating that other organizations are seeing this. This is what the industry is seeing, confirming that, which we'll hear, and, uh, and highlighting that. <clears throat> Yeah, and I think, you know, now we're closing on the five minute mark of the call and something good to recap is, you know, while it's not specifically tied to, you know, building the value um, within this conversation, but pace, pitch and tone. So the, the rep sounds extremely comfortable, conversational, isn't speeding through it, isn't uh, boring the prospect to death. They're not uh, using uh, massive fluctuations in the inflection points in their voice. She is just keeping it a back and forth dialogue and conversation, extremely confident in what she has to say, the questions she has to ask, and the direction she wants to take the call. So pace, pitch, tone, and uh, the fourth one you could add would be control of the call is something to take note of and be conscious of as listening uh, when listening to this call and then also listening back on your own and critiquing yourself. Right. <clears throat> okay. Or you can play. How, how does that sort of fit into your strategy? Um, yeah, I mean, certainly it's something we know needs to happen. Um, you know, our, our events like digital marketing and the revenue optimization conference are really more geared towards higher seniority, um, industry professionals. So by and large, there aren't as many younger, uh, professionals at those events. So it's not quite as, as necessary, um, but we do try and you know bring younger people into all of the things through through scholarships, and you can our student chapters. Stop here. So again, back to our our point on the whole millennial and engaging with millennials. It was not a top business challenge for this particular prospect, but he acknowledged it and was still engaging and she was still able to obtain. So the point here is you might not know every single business driver or business challenge that they're facing, but if it's one that's being experienced in the industry, it's still going to resonate with, with your prospect. And I think that this is a good example of that. Okay. That as well to, uh, you know, make sure we're getting getting that side of it, so. Okay, yeah, that, uh, again, not too surprised to hear that's been it's sort of a back and forth, you know, where where these associations are standing within the industry. Actually, as I mentioned earlier, the um, American Hotel and Lodging Association was in sort of a similar place of whether to really focus on engaging those lifers who are coming year after year to these events, mm -hmm. uh, sort of focusing more on best practices versus being able to develop a leadership uh, a full, you know, demographic that they hadn't really touched base with before. Um, so, yeah, I guess just a little bit about us. Um, we're a marketing strategy and experience agency. Can we pause here? And so in the response, so she presented a challenge, engaging with millennials. The prospect pushed back, said that that's not really something that we're working on. And then she challenged that position by sharing relevant, the, using the same customer reference again, but sharing relevant stories about they thought that that was also not an issue, but they have uh, made the conscientious choice to focus there for specific reasons. So here's where we start to get some of the challenging, not necessarily just bowing down as soon as we get a any kind of pushback or objection from the prospect, but helping to try and change perspective and provide ideas that might run counter or opposite to what they currently think today. Right. Okay. Pretty specifically with these professional associations for a while now to really, um, you know, whether it's being able to take a pulse of these events, uh, seeing what's successful already and why, um, and being able to find any kind of weak spots that can be improved to really boost that ROI, boosting revenue overall, um, and again, really solidifying the reputation of these associations uh, within their respective spaces. Uh, so that being said, based on you know what I'm hearing from you, it sounds we pause it here. Solid plan. So that was about 27 seconds. So after the presentation of a business challenge, he pushed back. She challenged his perspective on. Um, that pushback and then transitioned, right? She hasn't really talked about what they do yet at this point, right? We're at 6.43 in the call and the 25 to 27 seconds before that was the first time she's actually given the elevator pitch for the company. 
but it was under 30 seconds. There was four really concise bullets as to what they do and the value that they provide to customers. Um, so it was easy to absorb and and understand what it was that they were, uh, what they were as a company and the value that they provide to their clients. So that was, a, I really like this part of the call. It was a nice, clean, succinct uh, value prop or elevator pitch, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, and I think, Kyle, I'd like to add that that's an area that we often see where our value proposition is not clear and concise. And again, it goes back to, are we making our prospects try to figure out what the heck we're trying to sell <laughs> or what we're, trying to, what we're trying to accomplish? So again, I would agree with Kyle's point that I think uh, she did a fabulous job of articulating very clearly and concisely the value prop. But again, keep in mind, I challenge everyone to listen to their own calls. If you, if you have call recording and say, okay, it wasn't clear my value proposition because we often hear value props that aren't necessarily clear in the prospect and you've probably all had them where the prospect's been like, what do you do? Or something like that. So I would agree it was a good, it was a great value prop. Right now, but uh, I would actually love to connect you with our, uh, our founder and CEO. He's particularly interested in what you guys have been doing recently and um, uh, yeah, I don't know if you happen to have any time in the next week or so, but would love to set up some time for you guys to chat. Can we pause? We'll stop. <laughs> I was just going to say, Kyle, I agree. we we'll pause there. So it's great that she went for the meeting. However, she still has not hit on what is in it for the prospect to meet with the founder and CEO. She is highlighting that he's interested in what they're doing, but again, keep in mind what is in it for the prospect. And that's where we need to continuously infuse and, and add value throughout the conversation. And a lot of the clients that I work with, as an example, um, sometimes they may offer, hey, do you want a demo? Or hey, do you want to meet with us? But it's not always clear to the prospect what they're going to get out of it. So maybe if, if in some cases you are offering to schedule a demo, you could say, Kyle, what I'd like to suggest is an interactive conversation with one of our product experts. So again, from this perspective, with this particular call, what will the prospect get out of engaging and having that conversation and meeting with the CEO? Super, super, super important. Yeah, I, I think just avoiding the, the word chat, right? No one wants to block off 30 to 60 minutes on their calendar just to have a casual chat with someone who they're not friends with, not a business partner, not a current customer. So be very specific in your in the ask. You don't want to just chat with the CEO. You want to have a productive conversation. That 30 minutes means a lot to me. So I need to know that it's going to be worth my time. I'm not sure right now, but um, if you could send me some more information about you know what you're doing and and you know we can go forward from there probably. Absolutely. Is there just out of curiosity, so I'm not you know throwing things that are irrelevant um, your way? What's sort of top of mind for you guys right now? What are you looking most to improve in the next couple of events that you guys are doing? Can we pause here quick? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the most common objection of all time, right? Send me information. And uh, I think that the that her handling of that objection was spot on, right? Push back to the objection, not just, okay, sure, here's the one page standard white paper that explains what we do. But what specifically are you looking for? What are you hoping to improve in your next event so that I can make sure that I'm providing you with relevant content that's going to help you improve in some way, shape or form? And Kyle, I'd like to add that I've been using that technique forever, and it always works. So again, depending on how you want to position it, that's great, Kyle. I'd be happy to send you some information. Again, what specifically are you working on or what areas would be of interest? And I would say 10 out of 10 times the prospect will give you additional information and additional insight. And in some cases, you can overcome even having to send the information, um, but if not, at the very least, you're getting additional qualifying uh, information. So, good. Okay. Um, I'm certainly, you know, always expanding, you know, the the uh, prospect database that we're getting to, um, and. Um, you know, certainly yes. I mean, always it's, it's, we want to retain the new people that we bring 
into the events and, and you know, mm-hmm. make sure they're taking advantage of other things in the organization as well. So. Okay. Yeah, I can definitely send a little bit of information about, you know, what we've been doing with a couple other associations. Um, is there any good time where I, I can sort of follow up with you? I know it can be a lot to digest on the, just reading mm-hmm. it, and a lot of times questions do come up. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess, you know, I guess sometime next week would uh, be fine. Okay. Do you mind if I shoot over a calendar invite just so we both have that on our calendars? Can we pause quick? So specifically in part to the call where we are asking for something, uh, the default position is to feel slightly uncomfortable about asking somebody to do something that they haven't uh, verbally confirmed that they want to do. So the default is to use more weak language and the sort ofs or the would it be okay with or the just all weak language, whether it's filler words, the sort ofs, the kind ofs, or would it be okay if we, and be more prescriptive in what it is that you're asking. If you're uh, sticking with the theme on this webinar and providing value through each stage of the conversation and every one of your outreach attempts, you should have the confidence that what you're asking for and booking that time is not going to be a waste of time. It's not a charity case. It's going to be mutually beneficial. So just be confident and specific with the ask uh, for time. Uh, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm looking at how does how does Tuesday look for you? Um, pretty good. Okay. I've got um, you know Tuesday afternoon is looking pretty open on my end. Um, would one p.m. around one p.m. work on Tuesday? Uh, sure. Okay. All right. Can we pause? Just making sure, right? It seems simple and obvious, but making sure that there is a specific time block uh, mentioned. So many of the reps that I work with, once they get an okay to follow back up, it says, sure, just call me on Tuesday. We'll review the content that you send over and have another conversation. But if there isn't specific time blocked out in the calendar with a calendar invite associated with it, in all likelihood, you're going to go through the same prospecting process of 10 touches and a pretty in-depth and robust cadence just to get that same person back on the line. Uh, so when you get the okay for follow-up, lock in a specific time, send the calendar invite. And I love how the rep even asked that, Kyle, right? So she said, is it okay for me to send a calendar invite, which is great. That's okay. So to make sure it's on there. Absolutely. Calendar. Calendar invite your way for 1 p.m. Um, what is the best email address for me to send that to? Uh, it's jsmith okay. at hsmai.org. All right. Okay, perfect. I'll shoot that over your way. Um, a little bit more about how you know, we've been working with a couple other associations to really retain mm-hmm. those new members and uh, being able to expand that prospect database altogether. Well, great. Um, Jason, thanks so much for taking a couple minutes here to chat with me, and I really appreciate it. I look forward to following up with you next week. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. And right at the end there, again, so we talked about earlier in the call, uh, the rep's ability to listen and uh, reiterate back to the prospect what it was that she was hearing, and she did that again at the end. He had mentioned specifically the content that he would be interested in and the Uh, the goals that they have as an organization. And she reiterated that again to him at the end of the call to say, okay, great. I'm going to send you this information about bringing on new members and retaining the members that you have, because that's what you asked of me. So show the prospect that you're listening and that you are going to continue to add value. Um, You're not just trying to get them to the discovery call. So you can check the box that you booked another meeting and move on to the next. Right. And I think the whole, she was extremely conversational throughout the entire process, which is very engaging. <clears throat> yeah, and the way that the the conversation flowed was through the asking of the open-ended questions, right? Um, not asking those closed-ended questions that are conversation stoppers of, uh, are you the appropriate person to speak with regarding your event strategy, right? That's a yes or no question that could have done the same type of role clarification she did in the beginning of the call, but that makes the, the conversation a lot clunkier. It's not how you would communicate with somebody in your normal 
personal life. Um, so that's not how we should communicate with people professionally and have this choppy, uh, herky-jerky conversation, ask intelligent, well-thought-out, open-ended questions that get the prospect talking and communicating with us so that we can then take what they say and use that to, to control the conversation from that point on. Um, again, we highlighted it in the call, but sharing customer stories, not just doing the name drops uh, that help to articulate the value um, that you provide your customers. Uh, John Barrows, uh, uh, very popular sales trainer, um, talks about it in some of his conference speeches all the time, right? The core differentiator of every single um, product company that he works with is actually the customer base, right? It's not the product, it's not the service team, it's not the behind the scenes code or, or that makes up the technology, it's the customer base. It's the only thing that's uniquely yours um, versus your competition. So sharing those stories is one of the number one things that you can do to help uh, build a case and, and demonstrate the value for those prospects. And just listening. Right, So it's hard, especially when you're a junior rep, to think about what you're going to say next. Um, are you in alignment with the value prop that you've been given from your management team? Are you doing proper qualification? Do you have the right information pulled up on your screens? Right, So there's so many things going through your head. Uh, at the same time, the prospect is, is giving you information as, after you ask that great question. You have to remember to be an active participant in the conversation, listen to what it is that they're telling you. Um, so that they know that you're you're there and that you're listening to what they say. Right, and I think using the prospect's language ties into both listening to Kyle's point. It shows that you've listened, um, as well as uh, it in ensures that you're able to provide a recap of the value um, that you can provide. And the biggest takeaway for this, this was an excellent call. Um, Kyle and I both felt that way, but sell the value throughout the entire process. And I think the example when we positioned the meeting with the founder and the CEO, we didn't sell the value for the prospect to actually schedule 15, 20, 30 minutes. All people have is time, and time is extremely precious. So if we're asking for time, be sure that we're conveying the value. And you can even say, I, I encourage reps, the value or the benefit that you'll get out of meeting with the CEO is X, Y, Z. So you can say that. Again, keeping in mind that people have limited time, schedules are absolutely crazy and absolutely insane, and people are not gonna commit to 15 minutes, five minutes, or 30 minutes for a call where they're not quite clear the value that they're gonna get out of it. Great. All right, so I don't want to necessarily talk about the bridge group and what we do in terms of professional services. Steve mentioned at the beginning of the call, we are an inside sales consulting firm, but what's more interesting probably to the people on the webinar is some of the research uh, and the resources that we publish. So the one that is featured here was written by our head of operations, Matt Bertuzzi, which is called the Sales Hiring Ebook or Hourglass. And what it outlines is creating a hiring process to bring on both SDRs or AEs in a process that mimics a sales process. So walks you through uh, attracting or how do you actually source candidates and make yourself appealing as an employer? How do you take just general interest or resumes or hits on your uh, social pages or your glass door and turn those into actual qualified candidates? And then how do you um, then make sure that you're vetting appropriately, extending offers and getting accepted offers? Right, so anyone who's in uh, B2B technology knows how competitive the hiring market is for sales, specifically within the hubs within the US. So having a tight and well-documented process to get people attracted to you in the door and to offer quickly is critically important to bringing on a new rep. So urge anyone who is a hiring manager or looking to bring on sales development or account executive or even customer success headcount, check out the ebook um, as well as any other resources or, or research on our page. Great stuff Great. for introducing that, Kyle. And thank you, Lori, as well. Did you have any last comments before we wrap things up for the day? Yeah. I was just gonna make one comment um, just on the customer stories because I think we talked about sharing a customer story can be super engaging, very conversational. Uh, prospects tend to like to learn what other people are doing. It shows you're that trusted advisor. I personally read the book by Mike Bosworth, What Great Salespeople Do, and I, 
I think it's great. I think it's an awesome book. It really outlines uh, the importance of storytelling in from a sales perspective. And so just as another resource, I just wanted to, to throw that out there. And I would encourage reps to come up with their stories ahead of time. I mean, we talked about the good open-ended questions that were asked on this call and the story that was shared and articulated. Write these down or think about them prior, right? Because we very often get the answer to the question that we ask. And coming up with good open-ended questions on the fly, I've been doing this for 25 years. It's not easy, right? It's easier for Kyle and I to sit and listen to calls and, and provide feedback, right? But we've all been in the trenches where we're, we're actually on the call. So I guess the takeaway might be, Sam, is, is don't be afraid to prepare. Think about your customer stories that are going to be relevant. Think about how, you, how you're going to share them. And, and think about those open-ended questions and, and jot them down if you need to. Um, but we all know how, how challenging it can be on a call to listen and to respond and to ask the next logical question. So I think the more pre-work we can do beforehand, the better off we all are. So that would just be something I, I wanted to add. Great stuff, Lori. I love it. So that's it on building value on every call. Next month, we are going to be on call camp on the 14th with Truly. We're talking about call recording laws, and we will be coaching one-sided call recordings. So we'll show you how to actually coach your reps without having what the prospect said. It's going to be a really interesting time. I'm pretty excited for it. Steve will be back in the driver's seat, and we'll see you all then. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Kyle, again, for joining us. Thank you Thank so much. You.